We know very little about girls on the moon, their stories and their need for protection. 2020 is the year when their stories get to the end. In every girl, there is a pippin. And just like the pippin, every girl deserves the chance to take control. Hi, and warm welcome to this seminar that Save the Children, together with Astrid Lindgren Company, is arranging to have the global report launch of Girls on the Move. I also would like to say welcome to all the ones that are joining us online. 75 years ago, an unaccompanied girl named Pippi Longstocking arrived alone in a new town, searching for a safe place to call home, which she did. And in that home, she did many things that had ins inspired many of us and many girls all around the world. Today, more girls than ever are forced to leave their homes in search for a safe place where they can call home. They're fleeing from violence and abuse and unfortunately, during unsafe migration routes, they're faced many times with even more violence and exploitation. There are also girls that, like Pippi, are very resilient and very strong. These girls are the Pippis of today. Save the Children has partnered with Astrid Lindgren Company to help expand the work that they already have been doing to support and create sustainable change for girls on the move. Today, the stories of many girls on the move will, will be given voice, and you will hear the report, the results from the reports will be presented. We also will have a dialogue together with politicians and experts to discuss the finding in the report but also to discuss why change isn't happening. Um, my name is Soledad Pinero Misa, and it's a great honor to facilitate this event today. Pippi Longstocking has always been a big role model for me in many ways. She always helped me find the strength when facing facts in, in a brutal world. But she also always reminds me to reconnect with my own and our own common humanity. She has said that if you're very strong, then you also have to be very kind. And that reminds me often that we are one human kind. And I hope that I will facilitate this seminar today in a way that is both humane and kind in Pippi's spirit. Most of all, we will give space for the voices of girls on the move. And now we will share one of the stories we will, that will be presented to you by screen. When I came, I was young, so I just followed my mom footsteps. It wasn't easy because we had problems with documents. So my brother and I like, had to stay behind because we got arrested in Zimbabwe. So apparently my mom was told that we will have to stay there until our documents get fixed. It's not easy. But then it's like a responsibility now, because I'm a girl, I have that mother heart, and I have to take care of my brothers. Well, the good thing about coming here, I would say, it's made me grow, and it's made me know how life works, because if I was back home, I will still be like, you know, under mom's family, and I'll still have 
wait to wait for them and I wouldn't have the courage to speak for me and defend my brothers. So it's built me in a way. And it's also good because I've always wanted to speak English and French because I felt like those are international languages. If I have to work in the media, I shall know. I know I'll be a journalist because that's what I, I want to work in the media and also have a restaurant one day. You need courage. You have to be strong and believe in yourself. That's it. Now, dear friends, it's a great honor for me to leave the floor to our very strong and kind leader, Helena Tibel, who is the Secretary General of Save the Children in Sweden. A big warm applause. Thank you. I want to warmly welcome all of you to the launch of our series of Girls on the Move and the research. To all of you here in the room, this fantastic venue here at Fotografiska, but also all of you who are joining us online. A warm welcome. And as Soledad said, my name is Helena Tubell, and I am the CEO of Save the Children Sweden. And I'm really glad to be able to be here today to be part of this launch, because this topic is really close to my heart, and it is also really close to the heart of Save the Children. It has been a really strange year, I think, for all of us. We have all had to adapt to new circumstances, and in this respect, we are extra relieved that the research we did was conducted last year, because it would have been very complicated to get these results during the pandemic. And under present conditions, these would have been almost impossible to conduct. But at the same time, we know that migrants and refugees around the world are amongst the ones hardest hit by the pandemic, which makes the research that we now have and its findings even more important. And we are actually not releasing just one report today, we are releasing four reports, as well as a global summary. And less than a week ago, Save the Children's International Movement also released a girlhood report for 2020 that specifically has looked at how girls are affected by COVID-19. And unfortunately, it shows that a lot of the progress that has been put in place for many years for, is actually now at stake for millions of girls around the world. And for girls on the move, the situation is even tougher. It's tougher than ever because closed borders make it more difficult to move from one country to the next. This means that girls are left with two choices. Either stay where they are, which often is in a situation of imminent danger, of violence and of hunger, or leave but on routes that are even more dangerous now than ever before. So why are we focusing specifically on girls on the move? Well, girls on the move, they tend to fall between the cracks in research, in policy, in programmatic approaches. And even if there is an increase in literature which deals with gender and migration, or children and migration. Few studies focus on the intersection of gender, age, and migration, and more specifically, on girls on the move. And during the research, we also found that programs are not always tailored to the specific needs that girls have. Because during the work with the report, we met girls, for example, involved in child labor, and they were doing this in domestic homes, as domestic workers in private homes. And they were not reached by the programmatic teams, which were focusing on child labor on the streets, which mostly is child labor where boys are. Save the Children Sweden, we are a membership movement. 
And it is through our broad base of volunteers and of engagement and of support that makes up who we are. And in that support, we also have very important partners who enable our work. And without partners, we would not have the resources to improve the lives of children everywhere. And that's why I am so specifically happy that Astrid Lindgren Company wanted to work together with us to celebrate Pippi's 75th birthday in a very meaningful way. And through this uh, cooperation, we started our common campaign, which is called Pippi of Today. And Pippi, she has so much in common with the girls that we meet. She came to Sweden all by herself in the aftermath of World War II to live in a small town in the house of Villa, Villa And she had traveled the seas, and most of all, she was strong, she was brave, she was kind. And girls on the move, they are strong to venture out into the unknown in the hope of survival and a better future, one has to be brave, because it is certainly not without grave risks. And these characteristics are also so well captured by the photographer Elin Sata. Elin, she is here tonight. And in this fantastic photograph that you can see on the wall here, Never underestimate girl power. And the artwork is also part of our important campaign. And if you might want this print, which I'm assuming you do, of course, since it's so beautiful, you can actually be part of an auction and bid on this print on Tradiera. And at the same time, of course, you will support our work on Girls on the Move. So to close, I would like to thank Astrid Lindgren Company and all the other partners involved for their commitment to Girls on the Move particularly, but also to us as an organization. And Pippi of today is a great example of what happens when we work together to achieve common goals. It gets creative, it gets fruitful, and it is really good. And the research on the Girls on the Move comes with clear recommendations for how we can improve and expand our programs for Girls on the Move, and the money that we raise through the Pippi of campaign today will help us achieve those goals. So with these words, I would like to leave the floor to my colleague Nika Machendetse from Save the Children South Africa, who will give you the background to our initiative on Girls on the Move. So thank you, and once again, big welcome to all of you. In May 2018, uh, Save the Children South Africa conducted uh, an exchange visit between Save the Children Sweden and Save the Children Italy. And during our um, deliberations and discussion with uh, colleagues in Save the Children Sweden, a discussion uh, started around the question of uh, where are the girls in terms of uh, children on the move in the region. And we, this came out of the realization in our practice that um, we were identifying quite a lot of boys, particularly in our outreach uh, program that we had launched, being an exchange program between uh, the outreach work being done in Save Italy. And we noticed that there were quite a lot of boys we were identifying in this outreach work and um, less girls. And we started wondering whether this meant there were more boys migrating or there were more boys visible. So the question came out during that discussion in, uh, in Sweden uh, with colleagues. Uh, and um, we took it further from there and uh, said Sweden made a commitment to actually support uh, a study to find out more reasons and um, facts around girls on the move. And um, the, the discussion around the, the gender segregation of children that we save in migration 
became quite topical in that discussion. And um, I'm quite glad to realize that um, that conversation that started then has resulted in a global study which has been carried in uh, three continents, if I'm correct. And the results that we have seen from these different uh, spheres that has been done is really quite impressive and um, informative in terms of programming. It's really strengthening our position as a movement as save the children and partners that may use this study to actually have evidence-based programming which is gender sensitive in terms of our response to children on the move and coming up with a response that will really cater and protect the girls who are uh, uh, in migration. And particularly for South Africa being a predominantly a destination country, this is going to be very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now it's my honor to present, to leave the floor to Sara Granat, who is the Special Advisor on, on Girls on the Move on Save the Children in Sweden, who has the task to share the findings and the results of the reports with us, which is not an easy task, but she will try to do it, and she will do it brilliantly. So a warm welcome to Sara. Thank you, and we will see, I will try to stay within my time and not repeat what has already been said. Um, if Nika was actually here, I would thank him for the good uh, introduction. Um, but as he was saying, this is a work that has been going on for quite a while now. The talk started in 2018 and then it's been ongoing with actually studies in three continents, as he mentioned. What we found, as uh, Helena also mentioned, is that a lot of the studies that do take place, they, they, uh, when it comes to migration, they lack uh, a gender lens, but they also, when they do have uh, a gender lens, can lack the child perspective. So we also found that the um, it was actually, there was a lack in, also in literature, and not only in the programming that we met uh, less girls than boys. Um, so the primary purpose of the research series uh, to start with was to generate evidence that we could use and improve our programming. But we have also developed recommendations when it comes to advocacy and also further research because there are a lot of gaps in all those areas. And I should also say that we have also produced a podcast. Uh, we have Save the Children documentary that you can find where pods are, and there's a new episode out there now. And that one used to be in Swedish, but now there are also episodes in English. The now I have to remember this part also. <laughs> Here we are. The Girls on the Move initiative is a global series of action, action research that put girls themselves at the center. Because girls are the ones best placed to tell us about their experiences. And it is a summary of the summary, one could say. Because there are four studies made, and then we have made a global summary where we sort of have taken some of the findings from all those four studies. So there is a really rich, uh, sort of data of stories from girls and experiences if you look at each one of the reports from the different contexts. Uh, the, they have been uh, conducted across four different regions and within existing Save the Children programs. Um, it ha has also engaged Save the Children teams to immediately strengthen the ongoing programs with the findings they have found while in the, uh, doing the research. And the places where we have done the studies is in Southern Africa, in Latin America, and the Balkans. Uh, the approach when it comes to methodology has been slightly different in the different regions, but 
the one that has been in common is that there has been a participatory approach when it comes to the girls interviewing them and also when it comes to interacting with the teams to, to have this uh, approach where you can learn while they are doing the research and also the, um, the review of existing uh, literature. Altogether, we have spoken to 104 girls and we have also spoken to caregivers, uh, parents, a broad variety of key stakeholders and, of course, Save the Children staff in the different contexts. I would say both in the findings, and you will later see also in the, the recommendations, what happens is, as we have also mentioned before, the girls they fall between the, track, the cracks. Um, the girls, as migrants, female and children, tend to fall between the cracks because, uh, but therefore, to account for their realities, multiple, multiple perspectives need to guide researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. And not surprisingly, girls on the move are different from each other. They bring a diverse set of needs, capabilities, and support networks. Policy and programs may not reach or effectively support girls if they don't account for this diversity. One of the interesting findings from the series relate to girls' care work. Girls across regions are involved in different kinds of care work. As Helena mentioned at the beginning, for example, there's the domestic household work, um, but there's also girls who are mothers or care for siblings or elderly family members. And this impacts both the risks these girls face and often prevents their access to services and activities. Another finding was that it was not always easy to find unaccompanied girls due to that one of the strategies for, for protection was to adopt sort of pretend families and travel with them. And therefore they would not be documented as unaccompanied when arriving to different countries. Narratives on girls' migration often focus on the detrimental aspects without acknowledging a far more complex reality for girls, and that is that movement generates opportunities as well as risks. The portrayal of the girl as a victim may hide the agency that girls bring to travel, as well as advantages they gain from leaving their home communities where they may experience violence and harmful gender norms. On the other hand, the victor's mentality while it does highlight the girl's agency, it can let duty bearers off the hook when it comes to ensuring girls' rights to safety, well-being, education, and health. This is important because it brings a nuance to the way we understand the experiences of girls on the move and also has impl implications for the way in which we can best support them, how we to prevent risk, but also how we strengthen their own capacity. Violence, organized crime, and gender norms are some of the things that limit girls' options for personal advancement and self-protection. But even so, we'll, we still see evidence of girls' efforts to protect themselves before, during, and after migration. To start with, migration in itself is a strategy for advancement and protection. It can be a response to immediate, immediate threats of gender-based violence in their households, or communities, but it can also be a strategy to get access to education or challenge gender norms. Secondly, girls employ a broad range of strategies to protect themselves and cope with challenges throughout their journey. Some of those strategies can include, for example, getting help from truck drivers and taxi drivers for transportation. It can also include pretending to be boys uh, take birth control pills to avoid pregnancy in case they get raped. But it can also be to find a male partner prior to or during travel. Or travel in caravans or together with peers or other migrants. Some of these strategies can produce mixed results. They can either protect them, but they can also be a risk in themselves. Where, for example, drivers of transport and partners can earn, turn out to be violent and abusive. 
Girls across regions also created peer-to-peer -peer networks and or solidarity networks between girls and women. In the Balkan region, we saw that the girls expressed that their mothers and sisters were their primary supporter. And in South Africa, girls got help from older women who had come before them and who helped and guided the girls once they arrived. Uh, one thing that did come up as a common trend were the experiences of violence, including gender-based violence, which was part of all aspects of girls' lives from origin communities through transit to destination countries. Uh, border crossings were particularly dangerous as both border guards and police could be persons who um, were violent towards the girls and their families. Many girls had also experienced or witnessed sexual exploitation and abuse. And for instance, having to trade sex for basic resources such as food and transport. One of the interesting finds that uh, sort of surprised us a bit was the fact that a lot of the girls interviewed in Southern Africa uh, stated that the drivers of trucks and taxis were actually persons that helped them, that would provide them with transport and food and help them cross borders by, by um, helping them to hide inside their trucks. This has been seen previously more as a risk to the girls, but for a lot of the girls, these were actually some of the things that they said made them safer during their journey. When it comes to recommendations, we have divided them into sort of general recommendations, uh, programming, advocacy, and research. And I will concentrate on some of the general uh, recommendations. Uh, let me see there, sorry, I got lost there. Uh, the primary recommendation is to listen and learn from girls. They are the ones best equipped sorry, to um, know how we can help them and how we can design the programming in a way that actually makes them safer. For interventions targeting children on the move to address their needs and to protect them, a thorough intersectional gender analysis needs to guide programmatic and advocacy efforts. We have to recognize and account for the diversity of girls on the, mood, on the move. And this is very important when we design both uh, programs, but also for authorities, for example. We have to also consider gender-based violence prevention and response as a core aspect of programming and policy that targets children. And something that also came up as a strong find was that a lot of the girls were victims of xenophobia and racism, and that this was something that that affected their everyday lives. When it comes to uh, programming, one of the things that we found was that we need to prepare and equip girls on the move. In the long term, that means to investigate the drivers of, mi of migration, in countries of origin, including gender and age-specific drivers. And we need to invest in creating and promoting safe, regular, and legal pathways to destination. But in the short term, also awareness raising, uh, correct information, and peer learning sessions can also reach girls with information and harm reduction strategies. One of the recommendations they came out strongly from the girls when it comes to uh, recommendations for programming was this uh, role of caregivers. So to integrate um, caregiving to their children, so to speak, in programming would be a very good way to reach girls. And that can be both siblings, but also their own children, since a lot of the girls do become pregnant or have children uh, during their migration. Let's see here. 
I will finish here. Uh, but one of the, one of the main uh, things when it comes to advocacy is to challenge state policies aimed at further restricting migration and making legal entry into country harder as they increase the risks that girls face while on the move. So that is something that we see very clearly, that the more difficult it is to enter a country, the more um, risk it is for a girl to try and migrate. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Thank you. It's, you. You're staying with me on stage, I hope. Yeah, I am. Yes. But <laughs> you needed to get out of I'll the just spotlight. Just yes. one minute. Okay. We will now welcome two more guests to have a dialogue together with, uh, with Sara. And uh, before I actually invite them, I would like to invite you, because we're going to get two experts here on stage, but I would like to give you the opportunity just to talk to your neighbor um, the one that is close to you now that we're in the corona times and just like share some reflections and what do you think if you have time just to share what do you think are the main reasons we today are failing to protect the rights of girls on the move so welcome just to say hi to to reflect a little bit with you Lead by example. Okay. Dear friends, I hope this is just like the start of uh, a dialogue that will continue. And especially we will continue it here on stage. I would love to welcome our two new panelists that we have with us. We have Alice Ba Kung. Oh, there she is. I was like, where is she? <laughs> now she's back. That is uh, with us uh, by link. Can we hear you, Alice? Just try, say something. Yeah, you hear us, but we don't hear you. Maybe unmute yourself. But now you do. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. I'm here. Very good. Alice, as you know, is an EU parliamentarian for Milieu Partiet. She's also a member of the Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs and the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committees in the Parliament. It's also an honor to have uh, Pietra Tötteman Andorf with us today. You're the Secretary General of Kina to Kina, but you're also the, the board president of Concord, who gathers 76. Civil, yes, so civil society organizations in Sweden. Well, welcome to both of you. Thank Have you been following the seminar, Alice? Have you? Well, unfor uh, unfortunately, I, I haven't uh, been able to, to listen to, to everything, but I have re read the, the reports, uh, so I'm, I'm well prepared for the discussion. <laughs> that I know. So that's good to know. We will come back to you with, with a question, but I think I will ask the first question to you, uh, Pietra. Maybe if we can change places so I can see Alice, you and me. You and me? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Or maybe, so I don't give my back. She doesn't see my back, okay. but I don't see her. <laughs> no, I don't see the whole panel. Okay, thank you. Okay, back. Um, Petra, you also mm -hmm. read the, the reports and now heard the, the summary. Yes. And also listened to the podcast that we highly recommend everyone to listen to. And I know it's not easy, but if are there any specific findings in the reports that impacted you specifically 
And then also, can you share with us how they relate in the work that Kvina to Kvina does and the challenges also that you are facing? Yes, I can. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, to Save the Children for bringing this extremely important uh, issue to the table, to the agenda again, uh, because it's necessary and it's something that's not that common. Uh, I think I would like to start with your question to see how this uh, relates to the yeah, work that the Kvinna, the Kvinna Foundation uh, is doing. So just really brief, we work in 20 conflict-affected countries in four regions. Um, the ones that are in common with the study you've done is Western Balkans and a few countries on the African continents. And we, as many other organizations, Save the Children included, we support partners in these uh, conflict-affected and humanitarian contexts. And very many of our partners, women rights organization, work specifically on these issues, supporting uh, girls on the move. And we also have a program in Sweden doing this work. And I think that there were several things in your report that stood out. Uh, and that's really worth noticing. And the first one I would say is the extreme violence uh, that these girls face. They face it in the countries where they live, their homes. They face it in their homes. They face it in their societies. They face it when they're on the move. But also, I thought was quite evident and also from quite a few of the quotes that you have in there, uh, in the countries that they actually arrive to. And the second thing that I would like to lift that I thought really stood out and I think it's extremely relevant now in these times of COVID when we see that the increase of poverty uh, all over the world, it's women's and these young girls' lack of economic empowerment, lack of their economic rights. They don't have them and it makes them extremely vulnerable uh, throughout this entire process. And I also thought that there are two uh, actors too few actors that seem to see it as their role to inform these girls about their rights uh, and about, well, their right to both economic rights, but also the right to their bodies. So, and then the last thing, and you pushed this, I think, really hard and it's important. These girls are extremely vulnerable, but they are also actors of change in their own lives, for their families, for the communities that they uh, arrive to. And I think this is something that we see every day, and I'm sure Save the Children does it as well. And COVID once again pointed to that. You know, this happened and women all over the world stepped up. They faced this crisis and they were the first responders in very many uh, instances. So I think that there are many uh, points in the reports that are really relevant to the work that Kvinna de Kvinna does. And like you said, uh, for those of you who haven't listened to the past, I mean, the reports are great, but if you have plug them in, it's 30 minutes, go for a walk and, you know, bring a tissue because you're going to need it uh, because it's heartbreaking when you hear these girls' voices and really talk about their experience yeah. that they have. But it's also extremely empowering to hear about taking this brave step. Yeah, but as you say, it's both uh, it moves you, but it also, in my case at least, it caused a lot of frustration because it's, this is nothing that is new. It's in, in quite the opposite is something that is increasing this situation. And with that, like a follow-up question to you, Alice, that had also read the reports, um, what were your impacts, but also were there new findings in the reports? And also I'd like, like to ask you, if you can share what, what are your opinions on how, why are we failing these girls and why, from a policy perspective, what are the reasons we have been failing these girls for so long? Unmute yourself. Unmute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sorry. It's okay. I was so into the conversation that I forgot mm. to unmute myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> But first of all, I would like to thank Save the Children uh, uh, as one of the most important stakeholders that we have in the, not only in Sweden and in the EU, but in the world. I mean, it's so important that NGOs and civil societies and volunteers uh, on the, I mean, who really sees and knows what's happening, that they have the, the chance and the possibility to report back to us. And I would say the main reason why we are failing is, and this is sad to say, but I think it's important to speak out loud, 
it's because we are lacking in the will. We are not lacking in the knowledge or in facts, but we are lacking in the will to really make a change. Because we all know, uh, even though we have new figures and new way to, to measure the, the suffering, we all know that this is going on. And still, we don't know, do what is needed to be done. And I think there are, are uh, and I think, because I think that we, that our politicians, that, that form new migration policies, that, that know how to save lives, and especially how to save those who are the most vulnerable, which are the girls and the women. I mean, we could do so much more if we had the will to do it. And to, to follow up, I guess, like people would ask, it's like, why? And our, I mean, or how can we increase the will? And what are you doing in the parliament to try to increase the will? And do you think that this kind of report helped in that process? Uh, I am, yes, I, am, I know that these kinds of reports helps. Uh, what we are trying to do is to invite, use the platform that we as parliamentarians have. We are 705 parliamentarians uh, from all different party groups. And of course, there are some party groups within the parliament that really don't, uh, I mean, and their politics are very clear. They don't want to help. They feel that uh, people uh, should be left alone. And uh, that's why it's so important that we, who really want to do more, invite and listen to the experts. And uh, Save the Children is, is one of the big expert organizations that we have. So what we do is that we invite them, we take the reports, we, we put them as background material when we uh, form policies that we try to get a majority in the parliament to, to vote yes to. Uh, and we, we use the, the knowledge that the expert organizations, the stakeholder organizations have, and we, we invite them to our different local organizations, but we also try when it's not COVID-19 pandemic, to, to go to them to see what's really happening on the field. But I think this okay. knowledge is so important because we as politicians, we are always colored by the way, I mean, I am a green politician, so of course there are a lot of uh, uh, people, uh, voters, like I say, but that is only the green. But this is not me saying this, this is fact from Save the Children, and they and, uh, show the figures that Save the Children and other organizations have brought forward, then, uh, I mean, it's uh, more truth-worthy than when it comes only for me, from me. Okay. Thank you, Alice. We'll come back to concrete things that politicians can do. And to uh, continue the dialogue, I'd like to emphasize that this is a dialogue so you can build up on each other and, and listen to each other and not only answer the questions. Um, so also comment each other's, uh, uh, yeah, comments, comment each other's comments. But Sarah, I would like to, like when you presented and you said that we were, while you were doing the report, say the children was also trying to adjust the way that you were working and we need a lot of like concrete examples and an organization like the Save the Children t that leads by example and sh makes sure that the girls on the move don't fall between the cracks as they do today. It's a complex issue, but uh, what are you, would you say are the concrete things that you're doing that could also inspire others and also politicians? Well, I think the first thing is that we, we already have a lot when it comes to the, the advocacy part and the policy makers, we have a lot of the things in place already that are needed for this change. We have all the conventions on, on women's rights, on children's rights, on refugee rights, on, and, and we have agreed to this. So I think it's important to just emphasize that we need to also follow what we have agreed to and not just have it be a piece of paper. So I think that is sort of the, the first step when it comes to uh, advocacy. And then when it comes to programming, I think it's uh, the, the reports hopefully will inspire others to really look at seeing what we try to emphasize in the report, the differences between different um, groups of girls, because we could see that groups in Southern Africa don't have exactly the same challenges as the groups in the, uh, as the girls in the Balkans, for example. 
uh, they do have things in common, but they also have things that differ. So it's important that we don't have a one size fits all or think that um, the programming that we do in one place will fit perfectly in another place. Uh, and apart from that, I think the whole of giving the, the correct information and strengthening uh, girls in all contexts is something that we can encourage uh, ourselves to, to be better at, uh, but um, also encourage other NGOs and other stakeholders to, to do. Mm. And to bridge to you, Petra, and the, the Petra. I can, I can say it in Swedish. You <laughs> can say it whichever <laughs> way you like. Um, the, and the work that you're doing in other, in civil society and within Kvinna till Kvinna. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the, what it's, it's needed to actually to increase the results? And how are the, you, you have read also read the recommendations in the reports. Mm -hmm. How are these recommendations aligned with the work that you're already doing? And are they compatible with the resources and the possibilities the civil society have today? No. No. Your last question. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. No, I think, uh, I mean, it's not just like Kvinna to Kvinna. There are a lot of uh, Swedish organizations that don't do the direct programming and work, but they work through partners. Uh, so looking through the recommendations that you had, I would say that they align pretty well or very well, actually, with the, uh, the agendas that the women's rights organization in humanitarian context and in conflict context have. It's about the, the gendered... Uh, uh, aspects of programming, the gender aspects of humanitarian programs, but also looking at how migration laws uh, and processes affect women and girls. So I would say that they're very much in line with what local and national women's rights organization are pushing forward. And I think uh, in, as you're saying, uh, there were two things in the report that I thought was really interesting. And the first one was uh, when you talked about, in the section that talks about the coping mechanisms. Uh, and of course, what stood out to me was, well, basically the base of how Quinna Te Quina started when they said that it's, they sought a lot of comfort in other girls that were around them and in older women that they took responsibility for each other and that they shared coping mechanisms and strategies on how to make this being on the move more safe. And that's exactly uh, what we discovered in the mid 90s when we came to refugee camps in the Balkans that there were there were women there already and they had already formed these so-called safe spaces where focus was on dealing with the trauma from being exposed to sexual violence, but also sharing experiences on how to dealing with this conflict. And linking to what you said, that it's not, it's not a one size fit all. We can't do the same in Southern Africa as we can in the Balkans with women coming from Afghanistan as in Colombia, which means that the local organization and the national organization, it's in that mix where you get that experience and the expertise from that context, because we know that women's rights organization, they're always there in the refugee camps. We see it now in Lebanon uh, after COVID when a lot of domestic work a lot of young women were thrown out of their homes because of COVID, and that's yeah. when the local women's rights organization stepped forward. So I think it's this mix of big organizations uh, like Save the Children and just like Alice said as well, because you have this strength behind you mm -hmm. when you come with your expert voice, but mixing that with the local women's organization. And no, they do not get enough resources uh, to push these agendas, to be in the front line every day. So I think that this report in complement with all the other things that we have, that's when we possibly could push the agenda forward. And as a feminist, of course, what can we do? I would think that my go-to answer would be, well, if we all crush patriarchy together, you know, we had come a long way on that road, but <laughs> that might be a tad bit, uh, a big of a conversation for tonight as we're getting to the end of this conversation. But for me, that's where I, we have the lack of political will, because there's a lot of power invested in the way that the world looks today. Yeah. Seems like if, uh, like, Pietra is saying that we have a lack of political will, and it seems like you as a politician agree on that, uh, Alice. Mm. And uh, also that many of the, the political decisions that are being taken are not making things better for migrants or girls on the move or women's rights, always overall. 
Uh, you also read the recommendations in the report. What are your comments and what do you think it's needed? Also, what are, or how do you see the situation when it comes to the policies both in Sweden and the EU and on a global level right now? First of all, I, I have to uh, underline and agree with what Petra said right now and what Sara said earlier on. Uh, we need to, um, of course, do everything we can in the situation we are in, but I think it's important to spread the knowledge that right now it's not that we only have to fight to make sure that girls and, and women get the, the rights uh, uh, foreseen and that we really do our uttermost to make sure that they can have their, their, their rights uh, also when they are on the moon. Because we also need to defend uh, human rights. Uh, it's so sad, but I'm in so many discussions uh, within the parliament with the uh, political politicians from other parties and having to defend the right to seek asylum is a case. If somebody had told me this uh, 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, when I studied at the Stockholm University, I wouldn't believe it. But right now, we have to defend the right to seek asylum. And this is, this is a fact. And I think that I meet too many people who are not aware of this. And we know that if we start to uh, think that human rights are negotiable, then we know who will suffer the most. It will be the girls. It will be the women. So what, what Peta said about patriarchy is absolutely right. And um, it's, it's like a living nightmare, uh, I think. And so we really do need to do so much more. And the recommendations that, uh, say, the children put forward in, in this report are, of course, uh, absolutely uh, extremely valuable, uh, not at least when it comes to legal pathways and uh, to make sure that we have policies that uh, takes extra special care of the most vulnerable groups and so on and so forth. So I will take these recommendations and put them, add them to the work uh, being done from the Greens in the Parliament and really be strengthened that uh, we have uh, Save the Children uh, as the uh, I mean, as the, the expertise organization putting these uh, recommendations on the table. Thank you, Alice. Now, Sara, I guess you are happy to hear that from Alice, I would say, um, and also agree with Pietra, but um, what would you say, what would you like to highlight to both Alice and Pietra, but also to all of us here on what Save the Children needs what kind of support and how all of us can get engaged in making a difference and support to save the children's work for girls on the move well i think it depends on very much uh, where you are obviously there are different ways of, of supporting but the the kind of work that uh, some of the politicians and definitely in in the two uh, parts of the the parliament where where alice is working uh, there is a lot of important work being done uh, even though we know that it's uh, in a lot of ways going backwards more than more than forwards, uh, but I do think it's very important to, that we keep having those uh, politicians there that that do fight for the human rights and fight to to keep these even if we would like to move forward. Um, I think when it comes to NGOs, uh, it's important that we that we share our findings, that we share our experiences, and that we also work together in the best ways that we can, so that we can learn from each other. And, and I think it's a good example of um, when we do these things, for example, that we share the work and the research that we do with each other, um, because I think we can widen the um, sort of perspectives that we can have, because we do have our different sort of strengths. Um, where Save the Children, obviously, we have the, the strength of, of the child perspective. Um, so I think that that was one of the, the important things. And then we also have uh, many people here today that are involved in the, in the PIPI campaign. And I think that's also important because it's a way for us to reach more to the public to have companies sign up to, to the PIPI of Today campaign 
and highlight in, on their platforms the importance of Girls on the Move and make them seen there that uh, there are a lot of actors, not only <laughs> sort of uh, the usual suspects, as they say, with, uh, with us um, thinking that this is important, but there are also a lot of other actors in society that do think that these issues are important. So I think that's also important to, to keep um, moving forward and keep spreading the word and a little bit like the example with the truck drivers and the taxi drivers, that we also need to see that maybe there are actors that we haven't worked with before that could be good uh, partners for us, that we could work with more. We, we heard from the girls that there were certain taxi companies that were safe to go with. What are they doing, which is good uh, for the girls? Can we, can we spread that? Can we work further with that? So I think it's good to look at uh, different partners and reach out to all corners. Good. Thank you, all of you. And I think that of reaching out to all corners also like reminded me of one Pippi quote. She has many very brilliant quotes. And it's, she said that, let me tell you, it's dangerous to keep quiet too long. Your tongue shrivels up if you don't use it. And now all of us have been listening to the stories of Girls on the Move, and I think it's all our responsibility to not keep quiet about it and also support all of us in the movement to create the change that is needed so more, not only politicians, but politicians are voted by us, uh, but also uh, can create the change. And so it's not the way that it's now, like Ali said, that not too many care. And I think it's important to show that that we actually not only care, but they were willing to participate in creating a difference. With that, I would like to thank the whole panel, and I think Helena is also going yes. to yeah, leave the word to Helena. I have the great honor to hand over some fantastic flowers, and Alice, I am really sorry, but I don't have flowers for you. Um, but if you would have it's been okay. here, we would of <laughs> course have given you flowers. So, Soledad, thank you so much for a fantastic, for moderating this so fantastically nice. And we really know that you feel strongly for this issue. So thank you so much. Thank you, Eliana. Thank you. And thank you, Pietra, also for joining us in this panel. And it's fantastic with your experience, your expertise to link this to the rights of children and women, girls and women. So thank you so much. Thank you. And Sara, of course, for your fantastic knowledge and bringing this forward within Save the Children. Thank you so much, Sara. Thank you. <laughs> and Alice, uh, flowers from my heart to you, uh, but uh, <laughs> that you really so strongly advocate for this. It's fantastic and we feel your passion through the video, so thank you so much. And we also have a book to each of you. This is a Pippi. Uh, Pip is celebrating her um, birthday, so we thought that this would be a good book to give to you as well. And Alice, we will make sure you get this as well. So thank you, thank everyone, you so and much. thank you for joining us, everyone in the room and online. Thank you. Thank you.